Welcome to this Office Hours conversation on animating history. I'm James Todd from Duke's News Office, and I am here with Caroline Brazelius, A.M. Kogan Professor of Art and Art History here at Duke, as well as Ludovica Galeazzo, a PhD candidate, a PhD candidate jointly at UAV University and Cafascor University in Venice, Italy. And to, to dive into this conversation, uh, Professor Brazelius, can you talk about this collaboration with Ludovica and other colleagues in Venice on visualizing Venice? What is that? Well, let me tell you about the project, James. It began as an experiment. Okay. The idea was, what would happen if we took new emerging digital technologies that model and map cities, mm -hmm. and we used new research that is ongoing research emerging just now and trying to show people, <clears throat> show the public, how cities grow and change over time. So I called up my collaborator in Venice, Donatella Calabi, and I said, what do you think if we did this? And she said, sure. <laughs> so what started as a kind of one-off experiment that was going to la last maybe a few months suddenly exploded into a multiple university team project that now has about 25 participants. And we've got an example of this work of using digital technology to, to animate the past. And so this is a, a visualization of the Academia site where the Academia Museum is in Venice. So let's take a look at that. And Professor Brazelius, as we see it, could you tell us what, what are we seeing here? We're going to see the time change. And so talk us through this. Okay, so what we have here is a site which is now the major museum of Venice, but that used to be part of a confraternity that is a religious group and a church. And you can see our model is uh, time referenced. There's a time scale below. And uh, we, we are showing here how this site changes over time. So a tower comes, a tower goes, uh, a bridge is added. You can see that right now. Uh, that's going to change. <laughs> the bridge is going to go away. Another bridge is being built. The Vaporetto lands there. So we can show a city as an organic process of change. And, and you talked about uh, space being an amoeba. It, it moves, it shapes. What do you mean by that? Well, this is funny because we think of buildings made out of brick and stone as permanent. But buildings really transform over time. We can see that at Duke campus, right? Things are remodeled, new things are put up. How people move through space is renegotiated. Spaces take on new functions. And we don't really think about that. We think about space as frozen. But it's not. It's amoeba-like, in fact. And I love the fact that we can show this in our models. And, and what are we seeing in this model that we just saw now that, that is easier to see than it is to say, you know, write a few pages, write an article about? Well, w above all, with these models, we can communicate to the public stories about where they are. So our dream is really to have apps, right, so that you, James, when you go to Venice, one day. Will, on one day, will <laughs> have uh, your cell phone or your iPad, and you'll be able to click on the Academia Museum and see what it looked like in 1500 or 1800 and see how it's been renegotiated to serve its present purpose as a museum. And, and Ludovica, you joined the uh, Visualizing Venice project about a year ago. What was attractive of interest uh, the project for you? Well, I think that uh, the most important thing that attracted me is the possibility of studying and communicating the history of this specific and unique city as Venice is in a new way, focuses on the dynamic aspects of both space and time. You know, Venice has a long history, a history of uh, building uh, urban transformation, but also a history of movements of people, of things, of materials that characterize the city for or, <laughs> all um, her time. And so the possibility of uh, piece together these long-term events um, and to reconstruct like a journey through time, a learning experience where uh, people could uh, understand the, and chart the stratification and the events in a very dynamic way, I think that is the real goal and uh, what is interesting in this project. Not only about the, build, mm, about the buildings, but also about the, um, the changes in perception, in fruition, in routing, in access of this building. And you're a student uh, in Venice and are from right nearby. And yeah. So it's a new perspective on, on, on your own home. Now, one aspect that you've been involved in is, is we've got another animation that takes yeah. a look at the same site. 
the Academia Museum, yeah. but uh, a bird's eye view of, of the whole neighborhood. So if we could take a look at that and kind of talk us through what are we seeing here, what information is yeah. being conveyed uh, visually by this. So here we go. Here is a, a video about the transformation, the changes in the entire insula of the Academia. So we started from the year 1500 and we can look at the bottom the changes about the Fundamenta delle Zattere, for instance, and the construction of the Church of the Gesuati and then the convent and then about the urban changes, about the aggregation of the three smaller insula that connected the area, where when the um, two canals were filled up. And so I think that this kind of video also allows us to understand not only the changes, but also the um, altered perception of the buildings, because if we think about uh, the complex of the Academia, once was uh, uh, completely um, like a fortress in the midst of the water, and now it's a building uh, surrounded and uh, uh, inside the city, and we can have a, a tour and it's integrated in the city. So the perception, our perception is completely different. And also if we think about the bridge, for instance, well, what is, what was the impact of the construction of this bridge, not only on the viability of the area, but also to the assets of this building. So I think that is useful, this kind of representation, to think about these things. Yeah, and Professor Brzezales, Venice is especially interesting because of its famous canals, but um, they haven't always been that way, and some get filled in, and so, so talk about how the, the map changes and what you see from that. So James, uh, um, Venice was designed to be experienced from the water. Normally people would have traveled by boat. <clears throat> With the coming of the train in the middle of the 19th century, Venice became a much more pedestrian oriented city. So they had to put up bridges, which they didn't have many of before. They had to fill in canals to make enough space for people to walk. So if you think about Venice, uh, most of the great buildings their front facade is on the canal. <clears throat> when we come at those buildings now, as tourists, we come in the back door, because most of us don't travel with our own private gondola. We <laughs> come in by <laughs> foot over these bridges. So we come in by foot, and we come in the service entrance. So the city, in a certain way, has been turned inside out, right, by a change that occurred about 150 years ago. Most visitors to Venice don't think about that detail. And so we're looking here at a, a, a map of Venice, and. Um, Tell us again, is this the uh, Academia site again? No, this is a, the site of uh, a great Dominican church. No, which one is that? Yeah, I can't see it from uh, here. It? The first one was the Santi Giorni e Paolo. Yeah, the, was, uh, the Dominican Giorni. church. And now you have a series of snapshots which are showing the kind of documentation we use, for example, paintings and prints by Canaletto, and how we are making models. This is the site of the Biennale, which we have a new project on, which is going to show how that whole area of Venice was transformed. Here's our team working away in multiple languages. <laughs> Here's the Academia site again with yeah. a tower still there and no bridge. And that's another view of that. Mm -hmm. Santi Gianni e Paolo yeah. again. And is this, um, you know, Venice is, is famous for uh, its sort of beauty and, and aura of romance. Um, and these animations are, are sort of beautiful in themselves, exciting. But can you talk about what's, what's the scholarly value here? You know, why it, it, it does academics work on this? Well, the whole point, I think, is to think differently about the humanities. That scholarship uh, really should be something that we do, but then we think about how we can tell good stories about the past. How can we get the wonderful knowledge that is generated from the archive out into the public sphere, making models and maps and interactive apps that get other people excited and interested in the place they are in a completely deeper and more engaged way. And, and Ludovica, what are some of the, the, history, the historical stories about Venice that you're, you're researching, you're exploring, and, tr and trying to tell through these animations? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, all these stories uh, allows us to better understand also the area we are working on because we have to reflect uh, better on the documents because we have a lot of documents, uh, archival sources or uh, iconographic sources and so on. But we have also to think that uh, um, how uh, can we make 
people familiar with this kind of document. And so we have to analyze it and analyze also the building because when we have to draw a building, if we haven't uh, really understood its shape, uh, its shape in time, over the time, it's impossible to draw. So I think that the real uh, new way of study is this, to analyze the documents, analyze the building, and make sure to have understood everything. And that's, that's good. What, what, what are the source documents here? I mean, we're seeing a computer animation, but that's not what a historian starts with. No, in fact, Venice, um, one of the many reasons why Venice is such a remarkable place for this project is it has probably the richest and longest lasting archival sources in the world. Archives that go back into the Middle Ages uh, and a kind of continuity of information that is really important. So to get scholars mining that information and then telling stories is really very important. And Ludovica's point about learning by making, mm -hmm. when you start to model something or you start to map it, you are pushed to ask questions that you would never ask if you were writing about it. Okay. So you have to really look at your sources and understand them differently. And it becomes uh, an amazing adventure yes. right, in, in pushing knowledge into new areas. And, and Ludovica, you were asked by someone in the cultural ministry, why not write a book? So why, <laughs> why a computer animation and not a book? Uh, because I think that it's uh, really impossible to um, make people understand this. For instance, the case uh, studies of the academia. Why and how uh, can we make people uh, understand um, a history of a complex building that uh, um, once held a church and a scuola grande and the convent of Lateran monks and then was first home of the Accademia delle Belle Arti and then the Galleria dell'Accademia and, the, and it is uh, uh, changing again now because it's under restoration and uh, it's also during the time changes a lot a lot uh, its um, architectural architectural features uh, when uh, the decoration for instance were stripped out and when we are in the um, in the ancient church today currently uh, we have not the impression that we are in a, an ancient church because now there is a floor that divides the church into two parts. And so we have the, our goal is to make people understand these things and in a book it's not possible to do that. That's right. And Professor Brazelius, when you're doing this, um, your training is in history and architecture. So you're needing to collaborate with mathematicians, with computer scientists. Uh, can you Can you talk about how those collaborations work. So what has evolved over the past three or four years is that all these projects require a profound collaboration. Computer science, media studies, uh, his historians, art historians, urban historians, everything we do, engineers, I shouldn't forget them, everything we do is really teamwork. That's also um, not only inherent in this project, but that kind of teamwork approach is also behind so much of the teaching initiatives we're taking at Duke, where we really find that by pairing up with somebody in computer science, uh, we end up asking questions and using computer science to get students involved in finding the answers to those questions. And are there some pitfalls? I mean, you could sort of start a joke, what happens when a historian and mathematician walk into a bar? I mean, there, there, there must be some challenges to that. Well, all these projects have huge challenges. The project with the Italian collaborators has a lot of challenges about language, quite simply. Language that is historical language and uh, computer science language. Uh, it also has to do with academic cultures, which are quite different, and also cultures around open access, intellectual property, uh, all those sorts of issues are things that we are constantly negotiating with each other. Here at Duke, uh, we have had to rethink how we teach these team-taught courses uh, because obviously if I'm going to be teaching with a collaborator who's from computer science, I'm not going to give my students the same package of information that I would have 10 years ago. I'm going to have to tailor my teaching to this particular project and its goals. So the students may get a very different kind of learning experience. I think, though, to go back to our earlier point, that this learning by making gets them much more directly engaged in what that subject is. And let's take up an interesting example, this course you've taught, Museums Inside and Out. 
that uses uh, art objects here in the National Museum and uh, challenges students to uh, put them in virtual context. Or talk, Can you talk about the course? Yes, I'd love to talk about that course because that's something that's going to be something we're working on in the future. Um, if you go to the National Museum and you go into the medieval collection, you'll see these pieces of sculpture hanging against a white wall. So we can ask ourselves, how many people out of 100 are really going to understand what that piece of sculpture is? So can we use technology to mediate that object, to present a context for it, to engage that object with its original setting, which might have been on the facade of a church, it might have been in a portal, it might have been on an altarpiece, it might have been in any number of contexts. All these things belong somewhere. And the museum installation, not only at Duke, but almost everywhere, really is presented as though these are purely aesthetic objects. An object against the white wall or An on a pedestal. The and it's, we forget that it's part of a church. We forget it's a sacred object. We forget that it had a body and that body was in a portal. So can we get students to engage with this question and start modeling the object in context. So we teach them how to do 3D laser scans, we do photogrammetry, then we teach them 3D modeling tools to make uh, the context, rebuild a portal or a choir screen, uh, and then put the object back. It, virtually in the, in the setting? Virtually, yes. of course. We're now talking with other colleagues in engineering and computer science about much more interactive things for the exhibition where you actually could, for example, take a, um, <clears throat> a color or a texture that we might get from a medieval manuscript and without touching anything, you put that color onto the sculpture and then maybe you pick it up and you put it back in the building all virtually. And so this could become a kind of game. And I, I think we have a, an example of um, a medieval sculpture of one or more of the apostles that uh, is at the National Museum of Art and then they, they've been uh, colorized, like Kodak yes. color. Uh, so uh, talk about, you know, what was your assignment to the students <clears throat> with that project? So we have to remember that although when we go to a museum, sculpture, whether it's ancient sculpture or medieval sculpture, looks stone colored, in antiquity or in the Middle Ages, it was painted. And it was meant to be seen painted. So those colors were bright and vivid. And sometimes they almost have a kind of cartoon-like vividness, uh, which is really quite charming. And, and you can think much more, much more effective as communications about saints or religious stories and so on. So to, we can't necessarily completely reconstruct the original color because usually there's very little trace of that. But we can do a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, and so to get the students learning Adobe Photoshop, and learning how to color and picking up textures from con manuscripts of the same time and putting them on the sculpture and, and showing what that would have looked like is quite transformative. It's a really interesting learning experience. And, and Ludovica, you're taking a couple of courses here this semester. Can you talk about you know, what courses you're taking and, and how the approach may be different from other uh, courses you've taken? Well, uh, this semester I take the course of Professor Vizelius about the introduction of art history and the one of Christy Lanzoni about mapping early modern Venice. I think that all these two courses uh, analyze uh, um, the objects and the particular things uh, we are working on and we are trying to understand how the digital technologies and the tools um, make us uh, able to um, recreate something and to um, animate and to describe in a new way more clear for us first of all and for the other people uh, the history and the object. Professor Brzez, uh, Ludovica mentioned you teach intro to art history. I'm sure uh, people watching have taken that, but how's, how is this not your parents' intro to art history course? So, it is so not your parents' art history course. It's not my art history course either in the sense of five years ago because I began about three years ago to think about, all right, so let's say this thing is made, this obelisk is made out of granite. Uh, this obelisk was taken to Rome by an emperor uh, and the granite comes from Aswan in Egypt. So how is it transported? How is it actually carved out of the stone, actually? Granite is really hard material, and we don't have good metal tools at this point. So how are we going to extract the shape of that 
obelisk out of the stone. And I want to remind you that an obelisk could be 60 to 80 feet tall. This is no big. small object, one big piece. Then how do we get it on a boat? How do we get it to Luxor or Karnak or where it may have been? That's one thing, down the Nile, right, on a boat. But then to get it from when the emperor comes along, the Roman emperor, to get it from Luxor or Karnak to Rome is another whole kettle of fish. Then it has to go across the Mediterranean with winds and currents. So getting students to engage in why something is made out of a particular material, to map it, to create a map, uh, and then to have the bibliographic sources that they can document what we know about ancient quarrying and trade and travel, <clears throat> and then to uh, think about what it meant for the Roman emperor to have brought that obelisk from Egypt and put it up in Rome, that, that uh, the meaning of that obelisk, so much of that meaning is about the difficulty of getting it there about the difficulty of getting it vertical from horizontal and across the ocean. So thinking about granite really takes us to a very new place in terms of thinking about the meanings of things, the meanings of works of art. And we're talking about uh, animating history. So we've, we've shown examples of, of animations of buildings changing over time, but there's also a sense of bringing to life the history. I mean, you're giving this example of, of materials, stones, tell a human story. I mean, there's people that labored to put those in place, there's a society that made it possible, there's the uh, economics behind that. So, so can you talk about how the, you know, the, a piece of art can tell a story that way? And so much of that story is about technology, right? Um, how the Egyptians made, lifted things up from horizontal to vertical, how the Romans might have done it, what are the stone cutting tools, what kind of boats are you going to use with a massive heavy object like that. So a lot of this is actually taking the traditional field of a history of art, which was about style, and making it a story about the lives of things, right? Where does this thing come from? How does it get from here to there? Why does that matter? Why does it end up somewhere else? Why did that matter? How, does, how did the Roman emperor or Napoleon or whomever, right, appropriate the past to create his own sphere of power? And so these are stories that have to do with uh, ideology, but also technology. And we're using technology to tell the story. That's what I really love. And what I think is so great about this new moment uh, in this course as I teach it is that we, through technology, come closer to the object itself in the sense of thinking about what it's made out of, how was that shaped, where did it come from, how did it move. This is really fun. And in talking about animating a, an inanimate object, the building a, a favorite project uh, that I saw that you did is um, a virtual cathedral. So you, you challenged a student to uh, design and create uh, a, a cathedral, a hypothetical uh, cathedral. Charles Sparkman was this, was this student. Can you talk about this project? What did he create? Well, actually, that project is part of something I have been doing since I started teaching quite a long time ago, which was in my Gothic cathedrals class. Since I had a lot of students who were from political science and engineering, they weren't going to read articles in French and German. Now, how was I going to get a research paper? So I decided to throw the idea of a research paper out the window and have students work in teams to design virtual cathedrals. One would be the historian, which meant writing a fictional narrative. One would do the decorative program, one would do the building, and now we've added a fourth member of the team who designs the medieval city into which all this goes. Uh, they work in teams in class and there's a competition uh, so that they get prizes at the end and I asked the dean to come and give the prizes, so Dean Laurie Patton came and did that just this past term. And those projects push the students to really reimagine the Middle Ages. Their cathedral design has to be appropriate for a certain moment, let's say 1220, a certain place, let's say the environs of Paris. They have to write a fictional narrative that talks about the saints and the relics and, and the economy of this site that permits the building of the cathedral, and then they have to design it. So Charles Sparkman's wonderful project that you mentioned is the outcome of that. Uh, th this is a young man who then went on to uh, graduate school in architecture, but who so sort of cottoned on to this uh, project that we would then pushed it farther with help from some colleagues to actually do the adjustment and put it in the dive. So this 
cathedral is something you can walk into. And the dive being a, a virtual environment here in the engineering school that actually has a, a, a with 3D goggles, it gives you a 3D image as if you're inside it. So then you walk into really a fictional space that's as tall as a real cathedral, let's say 147 feet tall, and you experience it as that tall. It's fantastic. So American students, especially, of course, we don't have a lot of cathedrals aside from Duke Chapel uh, here, but so I talk about a subject that's often difficult for Duke students to imagine. If I can take them to the dive, um, we also use the Duke Chapel as a laboratory, but you know, the dive cathedral is also a wonderful way for them to imagine what kind of space we're talking about when we talk about a building that's really twice as hot, tall as the Duke Chapel sometimes. And Ludovica, as you um, head back to Venice at the end of the semester, uh, yeah. um, having uh, become more familiar with these uh, visualization technologies, are there kind of other areas of uh, research or projects that uh, you might undertake when you go back home? Well, I will continue my PhD thesis that is about another part of Venice uh, called the uh, Insula dei Gesuiti. And I think that all these tools make us uh, also um, aware about the possibility to take the library shelves off and to create a real uh, cultural heritage where people could uh, uh, better understand themselves, their history, because we, mm, I am mm, working in an area where also I live and I know lots of people that live and study and work there. So I think that the uh, mm, city where you lives uh, and you could better understand with this kind of tools also thinking about your past, your stories and so. Mm. Professor Rosales, for people watching who, who uh, are in fact going to Venice or have been there, what are some um, kind of uh, fun formative resources that they might look up to have a better sense of the place mm. in history? Well, we haven't gone online yet. I wish I could say it was us, um, uh, but we will soon. Uh, and I think, of course, there, there are lots of wonderful guidebooks and so on, and there are some uh, apps out there about the history of Venice. I think what's unique about what we are proposing to do is to take real scholarly stories, scholarly research, and, and, inqu and make inquiries into different parts of Venice uh, so that a tourist could say, oh, where I'm standing, oh, I would have been underwater, right? You know, they did landfill here, and this is a completely new part of town. Because why? Well, because the f monks were needing more gardens or whatever it happened to be, and they, and they did that. So um, to engage people in the city as a kind of living, breathing, not frozen enterprise, but something that kind of changes and moves through time and is still changing into the future. I think that's what's exciting about it. It is exciting. Thank you both for taking time to do an office hours conversation. You're welcome. It was fun. Good. Nice. Ludovica uh, Galazio uh, is a PhD candidate at UAV and Kafoskeri Universities in Venice. And congratulations on doing the whole interview in English. <laughs> Thank, That's you. Impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline Brazelius is A.M. Kogan, Professor of Art and Art History here at Duke University. Thanks again, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Of this Office Hours conversation, along with many other Duke videos, will be available on the Duke On Demand website. That's ondemand.duke.edu.